Welcome everyone, welcome back. This is Michael Gibbs and I'm the founder and CEO of GoCloud Architects and GoCloud Careers. And here we're gonna, today we're gonna talk about networking for cloud computing. Most specifically, we're running a subnetting workshop and we're gonna teach you about subnetting, variable and subnet masks. We'll go through some variable VLSM variable and subnet mask exercises. We'll talk about what is CIDR or what is classless interdomain routing. We'll talk about classful and classless IP addresses. We'll do some AWS networking training because if you want the cloud to be your career, you've got to know the network. So this is essential cloud architect training. This is essential cloud architect sales training. And if you're trying to build a cloud architect career, a solution architect career, or an enterprise architect career, you must know the network. So if you're looking for your first cloud architect job, solution architect job, this is absolutely critical, critical, critical information. So we're gonna be here for that reason. So we're real excited to bring you to our subnetting workout work, workshop. Again, this is gonna be networking for cloud computing and networking for cloud architects. So let's talk about a few things before we begin. If you don't know us, please make sure you download and get your completely free copy of our AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate professional book. The link is in the description below. So please make sure you get your book, that completely free book for the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional, all in one book. The link is in the description below. And don't forget, in two weeks, what we're going to do is as follows. We're going to have a completely free, live, free Cisco CCNA boot camp, because that's going to be the best network training for cloud computing. We're going to give you the full Cisco boot camp. <coughs> and to let you know, the AWS Advanced Networking is about 250 pages of content. The CCNA is about 2,000 pages of content. And we're going to do that all live and free. So make sure you sign up for it <coughs> to help you get prepared to get that first cloud architect job, solution architect job to get you guys all cloud hired. So today we're going to talk about subnetting. So before we begin, let us know where you're at in the chat box. I like to know where everybody's from. Let me see where you're at. Abigail Marks, cloud hired. Elbow cough, yeah. I still have this upper respiratory infection <clears throat> for about a month. And of course, I finally got better. I saw my Rolfer, who's a massage therapist. And of course, he just tested po positive for COVID. So I think everybody has it right now. But, you know, that's just part of the world is going around. And I hope everybody gets better as soon as possible. But today, we're going to talk about networking cloud for cloud computing. So I'm super excited to see all you here. So. If you're here, you let me know where you're at. I can see some of you have gotten here already, and I see so many more of you will be coming soon. So you made it on time, Ibadaikia, all the way from Hungary. It's great. Margin's back in Amsterdam. Nick Love, Pierre, Aseo, welcome, welcome, welcome. How exciting. Kate Cash, good afternoon. We are so happy to actually have you here. So we're thrilled to have you here. Um, Millicent, I saw your name. That always makes me happy. Rahan Fernandez, I saw your name. Dan, I saw your name. Mehmet, that's really great stuff. So, Cloud Architect, Cloud Hire, Shapur, I haven't seen you in a little bit, and I'm so thankful to see you here today. Mr. Gee, welcome to the program. Theodora, thank you so much for being here. Tobias, welcome, welcome, welcome. Cloud Hire to say, oh, this is music to my ears. Rajesh, Ken Coonley, fantastic. Eva Doikia, make sure you hit that like button, please. Thank you. So CCNA, Tom, we're going to run that. And yes, it's going to be lots of fun. Cloud hired, Long Island, New York. I'm loving this. Legacy, Vir West Virginia. Zimbabwe, well, welcome from such a distance. Austin, fantastic, Sada. Bulgarian in Denmark. Oh, it's always good seeing you, Vidoikia. Cloud hired, Dallas, fantastic. Edison, New Jersey. And Neil, that's a place I know a lot of. Oh, Baby de Jesus is in Cameroon. Welcome, Raul in Poland. Welcome. How wonderful. Marty's over there in Phoenix, Arizona. Rajiv is in India. Fantastic. Ryan's over there in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I've been there. Travel with Benji in Dubai. I've worked there for a while. One of my favorite places in the world. Nagarajan in Dallas, Texas. Fantastic. Jacques is in Italy. Another nice place. Host of my home in Greece. And Chow, my special blue wrench, is there. And she's there. And Abigail's in Asheville, Tennessee. And Philly, PA, well, I went to school there and lived there. And of course, Marla is from Atlanta. And fantastic. And Joshua's in Nigeria. And Balwinder's in Dallas. And Downingtown, PA, Raul, I was a paramedic around there. 
And KTA Cyber Lab, I worked in New York for a long time. Claudette being in South Africa, that's fantastic. And Nike's in Texas. And Zambia, I love this. I love this. Scottsdale, Arizona for Robert. Betty from California. Wow, this is great. Ryan Wagner, hi. Live Harmony from Houston. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Mr. Gee, Cod Hired, Sacramento, California. You haven't been there in a little while. Thank you so much, KTA. We're so happy to help. Seta. Networking is fun. Yes, that should be everybody's hashtag. Networking is fun. Hi, Avicii. So good to see you over there, Amartos. Um, KCast in Atlanta, Cod Hired. So wonderful. Precious is over there in Australia. He's a fantastic architect and a great management consultant as well. Two things that are basically the same career. Marty's in South Africa, or Mervyn's in South Africa, fantastic. Got lots of good students there. New York, UK, that's fantastic, Kay. And Leo's over there in Brazil. Bob's in Wheaton, Illinois, I'm loving this. And Matt over clouds in India. So, surrender, surrender, you're on PTO again. I am so happy to have you join us here, Surrender. It's always a pleasure for you being here. Wow, New York, and Romanian and Ireland, this is just great. Carlito Way, UK. My family's from Greece. You are from San Francisco. Surrender, that's fantastic. Ciao, Bella, for the Italian. I'm loving that, and networking is fun. Jeannie, go back from California. Um, I know you're from a lot of places, Jeannie, and they're all really great places. Ben Christopher is in Atlanta. Rami here, good to see you. Cameron, good to see you. I know where you're from. Nike, fantastic. So, Let's talk about some networking things and let's have some fun with submitting. I see some Oakland, Australia. How wonderful that we've got so many of you from so many places. So today we're going to talk about subnetting. And in our discussion, we'll talk about what is subnetting. Then we'll talk about what are classful addresses, which don't exist anymore. Then we'll talk about what goes into subnetting. We'll go into how to subnet. We'll go into how to supernet. Then, of course, we'll have some subnetting, supernetting practice. We'll have some subnet planning. We'll do some subnet planning and design discussions. And, of course, you know, well, questions. We'll have fun. We'll party. We get stuck. We'll just work through examples. So let's make this cloud architect training, network architect training, solution architect training the most fun it can possibly be. And for all you branches out there, like Eva Dyke and Abigail, thank you for helping make this better for others. So. Let's talk about what is subnetting. Subnetting is quite simply the process of, of taking the, of actually, before we even get to subnetting, let's just talk about what an IP address is, just in case. So an IP address or an address is an address that's given to devices to communicate on a network. So if I want to send, for example, an email or a message to Eva Doikia, I need to know Eva Doikia's unique IP address, her globally routable unique IP address. <clears throat> and I can reach her. Likewise, if I want to send Abigail, who said she's in Asheville, North Carolina, a letter, I need to know the name Abigail. I need to know her last name. I need to know her street address, an apartment number if it exists, the city, the state, and a postal code. Now, if uh, Eva Doikia lives on 123 Main Street on... Uh, in Hungary with uh, a, a postal code. And Abigail, again, lives on 123 Main Street, but in Asheville, North Carolina, she's gonna have a different postal code and that's gonna make them unique. So I know uh, Eva Dyke is from Bulgaria and she's now living in Hungary, um, for example, or was it, or, 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 but so you know that, but I need her unique address. Likewise, if you wanna reach out to me, you can't just say Mike Gibbs on the envelope. Trust me, there's lots of Mike Gibbses in Africa. There's lots of Mike Gibbses in uh, Manchester, England. There's lots of Mike Gibbses out there. So you need the Mike Gibbs. You need my street address, the city in Florida, the state, and, of course, my postal code. So with IP addressing, it's the same thing. Everybody, in order to communicate, needs an address. It's how you identify the person on the network. The message gets sent to the address. Now, when we're dealing with IP addressing, each address is going to fall inside of what's called a network range. And a network range is a group of IP addresses. And now we're going to start to talk about the content of that. So subnetting is going to be the process of taking a network, which is basically going to be a large block of addresses, and chopping it up into little smaller things. And I'll show you why in a minute. But I want you to understand this. 
every interface on a server, unless it's part of a link aggregation group, needs to be on a different subnet. So if you have a computer, when you plug in your Ethernet port, that's an interface. That is a network interface card. AWS would call it an elastic network interface. But guess what? It's a network interface. It's just an Ethernet port. So here's the thing. Every Ethernet port on your computer needs to be on a different network. So if we're not careful and we use big networks, we could waste millions and billions of addresses on a single computer. Now, every device on the network needs an address. And we don't have an unlimited amount of address. We have a finite amount of addresses. So we must, must, must be intelligent about how we design our addressing. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. The person that does your subnetting for your company and your supernetting should not be the basic CCNA. It should not be the person with two years of networking experience. The person that actually does your actual, actual, actual network design and network addressing should be your most senior network architect. Wait, most senior network architect for the IP addressing scheme? Isn't this basic? Aren't you going to teach this in the next three hours? Yes. I'm going to tell you that the most senior CCI you have should be the person doing the subnetting. And here's why. The way you lay out the addresses in your network is like the way you plan a city. When you plan your addresses, it's like planning a city. Where do your roads go? Where do your streets go? Let's say you go to my village in Greece. It's a beautiful village. I know the pharmacist. I know the senator. I know there's a flacky store. It's a really great place. There's 5,000 people in the village, you know, 500 people in the village. Really nice people. Wonderful, wonderful people. That's my village in Greece. Now, you know, everybody knows me over there. It's simple. But if we need to go to another village, we need to go to another network. So what we're talking about is taking things and making them most efficient. Now, in my village in Greece, they do not have roads like the Autobahn in Germany. I can't take my car and drive and unload the speed. There might be some cobblestones on my street. Okay, that's part of life. Now, my street also comes up to a dock, which comes up to the ocean. Now, guess what? That's my street. And also, you know, the kind of power I have in my house and my village in Greece, you know, the power changes, you know, it's, the lights flicker periodically. You know, I have a water man or a water person deliver water because I don't drink the local water there. You know, that's the thing in my village. My village in Greece is the best place in the world. I'm thrilled there. I love it there. But the infrastructure isn't great. Why? Because the people that planned the infrastructure 4,000 years ago never assumed that building was going to be good. So if any of you have been on the German Autobahn, the left lane, and you're driving your car as fast as you want, and it's smooth as silk, because whoever planned this out, planned it out right. And many of you have been on cobblestone streets in the middle of France. And you know how hard it is to walk or drive your car or bike or motorcycle down the street. So the person that designs your IP addresses is like the person that plans your roads. You want the most senior person there because the way you lay out your addresses will defect your routing. And your routing is basically the infrastructure, the plumbing, how your traffic gets from point A to point B. And without the network, you know what you have? Absolutely zero. So networking, subnetting, most experienced person on your team and also an organized person so for me not mr organization i am not the subnetting guy i'm the strategy guy but you got to find the right person so subnetting and i'll show you all in a minute is the process of taking a big ip network block and breaking it down into smaller smaller things and that's why we're doing what we need to do so remember each interface needs to be on a sub network so without using subnetting, we'd be wasting most of the world's internet addresses on a computer or two. So let's say you've got a LAN, and I'm going to show you an example of a LAN. Let's say, uh, and my good buddy Alonzo made me this happy router picture. It doesn't exactly look like a Cisco router, but we're having some happy routers to try and lighten up uh, some of what we're talking about. So let's say this router has four interfaces on it, meaning four Ethernet ports. Each port has to have a, a different IP address on it. So look at it this way. If I use the class A address 2.0.0 slash 8 on, on the one interface, and I use the class A address 1.0.0 slash 8 on another interface, and I use the 3.0.0 slash 8 on another interface, and I use 4.0.0.0 on another interface, I've got a problem. 
by by using that subnet with a slash eight subnet mask, and we'll get into deep. I've literally burned 16 million addresses for this particular subnet, and more than 16 million addresses for this particular subnet, the 1.0. And then I burned 16 million addresses here, and then I burned in 16 million addresses here. So I've got a problem. So does anybody think I can stick 16 million systems on a subnet? Now, in practicality, you will never, ever in your career put more than 500 devices in a subnet. In real actuality, you will most likely never go above 253 devices in a subnet. I have gone to one subnet in my 25-year networking career that enabled 500 hosts. But guess what? That's one subnet in 25 years. Why? Why do we use small subnets? We need to optimize our use of address space. Why can't you put a thousand servers, Mike, in the same subnet? Here's the reason. Well, servers and systems and broadcast. ARP, who has the MAC address of this? DHCP, discover, give me an IP address. Unknown broadcast frames, send to everybody. What happens? Apple's devising, find me, find me, find me with Bonjour. Windows is pushing out this NetBIOS, SMB kind of stuff. All this stuff has going out. Broadcast, 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 broadcast. And when you get above 500 devices in a subnet, they all standing broadcast to each other. Broadcast, broadcast, broadcast. The system CPUs get busy. The network gets filled up with broadcast traffic and their performance degrades. So that's one of the reasons we're going to have to subnet. But it's not just that. It's not just that after 500 hosts in a subnet, everything falls apart. That's only half of the problem. Imagine having 16 million hosts in a single subnet and just single one of them gets infected with the worm. Everybody's infected with the worm. It's instant, it's fast because they're in the same subnet. And the only time you can actually do anything about it is if you're using something like an 802.1x authentication in the data center. But in the cloud, you don't have access to the good security things that you have in the data center. So you can't do like an 802.1x and you can't do a private VLAN to make sure that MAC addresses that aren't supposed to be there don't get on the network and private VLAN so one server can't talk to another. We can't do any of the stuff in the cloud. So we've got a subnet and we've got to filter our routing, super route, filter our routing and our things like that. That's where we're at. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind when we're dealing with subnetting. We're dealing with, gives us the opportunity to break things down into network boundaries. Guess what? When we break things down into network boundaries, I can write an access list between subnets. So I've got route filtering. I can limit routes in between subnets. And by limiting routes in between subnets, guess what? They can't talk to each other. So by using subnetting, I can dramatically increase my security. I can dramatically increase the performance of my systems. And I don't have to waste addresses. So I don't really think I'm in a position to waste 64 million IP addresses. Because of that, I subnet. And that's why you will too. You will always be submitting in your role. Now, let's say instead of using those slash eights in the previous example, see over here, I used the slash eight subnet mask on each of these things, and I wasted 64 million IP addresses. Here, I use the WAN subnet. A WAN subnet is a slash 30 subnet. It gives you two usable host addresses. It has a network address, two usable hosts, and a broadcast address. So, slash 30 here, slash 30 here, slash 30 here, slash 30 here. And guess what? I've used 16 addresses versus 16 million. Which do you think is more efficient? 16 versus 16 million. Heck, if I could pay $16 to get $16 million back, I'd be thrilled. So when you're spending IP addresses, spending like it, spend it like their own money. We run out of them. We don't have enough. Judiciously be careful at them. Don't waste them. You don't waste them from something. That's how you bring it back. So that's why we're talking about, and we'll work through a lot of problems here. I promise you. Now, about 20 years ago, we had this concept of classful uh, classful, classful routing and classful networks. And, you know, that went away about 25 years ago, but, you know, 
If you talk about subnetting, if you're going to take an AWS advanced networking course, which is basically they should call it an intro to 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 an intro of junior level networking. That's what I would call the AWS advanced networking course. But, you know, it's there. They'll tell you about Classful and they'll say we use classless inner domain routing. But, you know, this is what a class is. The class was based upon both the octet and the subnet mask. So anything that looked like 1.0.0.0 all the way to 126.255.255.255 is a class A network. Now, anything that comes from a class B range, and actually, you know what? Let me put this here. I think it'll be easier for you. Anything that comes from a class B range means it begins with the 128 all the way to 191, 255.255 slash 16 subnet mask. The class C addresses were the 192s all the way to the 223s. And the class D addresses, which are used for IP multicast, for which I built half of my career, are 224.0.0.x for TIT through 2239.0.0.x. Now, there was this class of experimental IP addresses, 240 to 255. Nobody's ever done anything with them for the last couple of decades. So keep that in the back of your mind. But when you're dealing with networking people like me, if they say a class C, they're typically referring to the subnet mask. If we say class B, we're typically referring to the subnet mask. And if we say a class A, we're typically referring to an APIC subnet mask. Now, practically, when people talk about classful networks, they're talking about this first octet. And that's what we're typically talking about. So this is what we're talking about. So let's kind of look at these class A, class B, and class C networks. A class A network gives you eight networking bits and 24 host bits. We'll talk about this in a minute. A Class B network gives you 16 networking bits and 16 host bits. And a class C network gives you 24 networking bits and eight host bits. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, we'll get into this and we'll get there pretty quickly. So let's look at this. So let's take a class A address. Network bits versus host bits. So what's that going to look like? Let's add something in there. So we've got... Um, Say this we've got for a class a eight network bits so what does that look like that's 126.0.0.0 so now what does that look like from a bit perspective so i want to make sure i can do this in a way that's going to be easy for you to understand so bear with me for a second here's what the mask is going to look like so that's the subnet, but let's look at the subnet mask. The subnet mask is going to look like this. For a class A, it's going to be one, 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 one. So we're going to have eight, eight ons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we're going to have, oops, make sure I did eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they're going to be on. And then we're going to have all of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight. So we've got nine, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, dot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now that's what this thing's going to look like for a class A address in the mask wise. Now you could see it as this, you could see it as this, two, five, five, dot zero, dot zero, dot zero, which is the same notation, or you can see what, you could see it listed like this, which is going to be slash eight. It's all the same thing. So why is that? Eight networking bits. Eight networking bits. 24 host bits. 24 host bits. So if you want to know how many hosts this subnet can do, does anybody have the ability to figure out how to do this? So let's talk about an IP address. It's binary. Binary has zeros and one. So what is zero plus one together? It's two. Now, that's going to be where the math sounds good. So for the Americans, it's going to be much harder than for the Europeans. In America, we start at floor one on the elevator, and then we have floor two. In England, floor is zero, floor, the, the main floor is floor zero, and floor one is floor two. So Europeans start counting at zero. Americans start counting at one. So if you have zero and one, that's a total of two. So... With binary things, we're dealing with a 32-bit 
address of which eight bit has two bits. So two to the power of 24 minus two will tell us exactly how many host bits we, how many hosts we can put on the subnet. And uh, we'll work through some of these problems together, but just keep this in the back of your mind. We're dealing with networking bits, host bits, and we're gonna do lots of math problems to work it out, but I just want you to understand some of the theory before we get there. So what is subnetting really? If in this particular environment, we're unsubnetted, where the class A has eight bits of network and 24 bits of host, and the class B has 16 bits of network and 16 bits of host, and the class C has 24 bits of network and eight bits of host. Now let's go back into this environment. Let's go back to the same class A. We've got eight bits of network and 24 bits of host. But what if we borrow some of those host bits to create additional networks? So what do we do here? If we borrow eight bits here, we have 16 host bits. Because total, we have 32. Four octets, each one is eight bits long. So if we decided to do it a little differently, if we decided to take 16 host bits here, what 16 plus eight is 24. What's 32 minus 24? It would be eight. So all we're doing with subnetting is basically taking bits from the host and giving them to create more networks. <clears throat> so let's say we went in a 12-bit subnet mask. And I'll show you what that looks like. How many host bits will we have? Well, 12 and 8 is 20, right? We have a total of 32. So this would be 12, right? All we're dealing with. So your class A's, when they become unsubnetted, have a total of 24 host bits. <clears throat> Now, let's say we started with this class B, 172.16. That's 0 to 0 slash 24. If I add eight host bits here, how many do I have left? In fact, everybody that's here that's present, for this class B that has 16 bits of network and 16 bits of subnet, how many bits do we have left over for the host? Tell me in the chat box, and I know you're, feel, you're feeling it and having fun. If not, we'll spend a little more time here. Okay, so good. We've got 16. We're stealing eight, which means we have eight left. Woohoo! Good job. I'm loving this already. I'm excited. You guys are getting it. You guys are great cloud architects, great solution architects. Let's get you all cloud architects hired. And part of that is learning the network. So now you know. So let's do a little more. Let's have some fun. Let's take this class C address and subnet it down a little more. Let's say we've got a 24-bit subnet mask here, class C. Let's say we decide to borrow four more bits. Now, how many host bits we have? 24 network bits, four subnet bits. How many host bits? 24 plus four is what? 28. 32 minus 28 is? Help me out here. I'm not good at math. I know how to practice medicine. I know how to design architectures, but I'm not Mr. Math. So 24 plus four is 28. 32 minus 28 is four. Woohoo! You guys are subnetting already. and You guys don't even realize it yet. So let's have a little more fun with this. We'll go through one or two more examples. I'm a big believer. You build deep, deep, deep fundamentals and everything else is easy. So let's build you some more fundamentals. Let's go subnet down this class A address. It's got eight bits of network. And I decided that I want to use 20 bits of subnet mask. Okay, how many people? And yes, Avishi, I love cats. I have a beautiful cat named Cindy, and she's the expert cloud architect. She does a beautiful job unplugging servers, chewing through Ethernet cables, using her paws to power off servers in my cloud, all kinds of cute. Okay, so 28, you guys got it as four now. How many hosts are going to be available on this 28-bit section in real networking, not AWS networking? Two to the X minus two. So two to the fourth minus two. Two to the fourth is 16 minus two. 
14. Now you know how many IP addresses in real networking, meaning any place other than the cloud provider. We'll talk about why they're different. And hey Mike, we got a lot of fours on that one just then. So if you want to reiterate that one, how you got to the 16 or the 14. Um, I think what was happening is the time delay and the latency delay. Okay. Or, but actually it should have been four. That was the correct answer. The, uh, okay, wait. So two to the fourth. So we had four bits of host bits. And then when it came to IP addresses, it was two to the fourth minus two, which is 14. So Rolly, you're good. Um, Hank, you're off by two. Abigail Marks, you're, you're doing great. And all of you guys got the number of hosts, right? And it was just the number of subnets per host. So good job, everybody. Good job, everybody. So what do you think we architects need to think about? How many hosts do I need per subnet? And how many subnets do I need? If I've got a WAN and there's only two links, left and right, New York, Bangalore, one WAN connection between them, what kind of a subnet do I need for two routers? Two routers. Do I need 255 addresses for two routers? Do I need 16 million addresses for two routers? Do we need 32 million addresses for two routers? Do I need a billion addresses for two routers? How many devices do I need to talk to Abigail? If Abigail is an IP address and I'm an IP address. To just talk to Abigail, if Abigail's a router and I'm a router, how many IP addresses do we need? Margin, two, exactly. Seda, two, exactly. Ahmad, two, exactly. Cameron, exactly two. Raul, zero. Everybody, two, exactly. Because there's only two of us. We need two IP addresses. So if we use a slash 28, a slash 28 is four bits left. Four bits. So a slash 28 is two to the fourth minus two. That's 16. So would a slash 28 be an intelligent subnet for me and I've got to talk to each other? No. Okay. Let's look at a slash 29. That's three bits of subnet mask. So I want to talk to Abigail. Two to the third minus two. Does that seem efficient? That's eight addresses minus two, which is six. I still want to talk to Abigail. Just Abigail. Nobody other than Abigail because Abigail has the cutest cat in the world. As cute as my cat, Cindy. And, and Abigail's cat and my cat want to FaceTime each other and have a conversation with each other and share photos of their favorite tuna and uh, shrimp and scallop. So, exactly. So, that would give me six. Is six a good use of my time? Absolutely not. Now, let's say, what if I did a slash 30? That's two subnet bits. Two to the second, which is four minus two. Wow, a slash 30 gives me exactly two IP addresses that are usable to use for me to connect there. And we're done with a slash 30. We'll never be able to use a slash 31, and we can't use a slash 31 for the following reason. It's two to the second minus two. So or two to the first minus two. Two to the first is two. Minus two is zero. So what we're dealing with is for our WAN links, we're going to use slash 30. Now, when we talk about subnet, we're going to talk about the ridiculous way that AWS did their subnet mask. But that's for the subnets that are in their VPC. But on WAN links, you're still going to use a slash 30. So here's a secret. Almost every single networking person in the world knows this beautiful secret. We use a class C slash 24 on almost every LAN interface. Because if you use anything smaller, I promise you, you're going to regret it. We use a slash 30 on WAN links and we get rid of all this silly business of slash 28s and all this nonsense. We never use them because it's against best practices. Slash 30 on WAN links, slash 24 on LAN links, and maybe as big as a slash 23 on a LAN link. If you've got a bunch of Linux systems, say maybe you had 500 machines mining cryptocurrency that have got a bunch of GPUs in them, but they're not sending a lot of broadcast. Otherwise, no more than a 250 addresses in a subnet, and you are done. So let's walk through some of this subnetting math and have a little bit of fun with it. 
you know, it's all really important to get that cloud architect job or a solution architect job. And yes, Jazz, I like to say cloud hired. I also like to say cloud architect. But you know what? My cat, Cindy, and Chris's cat, Sonny, you know, they're all out there and they're getting themselves hired too. So, you know, they should uh, get better paying jobs as cat cloud architects. I'm all for cat hired any day of the week, especially my cat. Honestly, she could teach AWS a lot about plugging in and pulling out the cables. And that one that actually have power outages, there might be a reason. She could unplug the transformers, unplug both power companies. She could shut off both generators, both sets of backup generators and both batteries. You know, who knows? So uh, let's go over this before we get into the submitting math, which we're going to do soon. Let's talk about how you calculate it. How you calculate it. It's as follows. The calculations to determine how many hosts per submit are as follows. We're going to look at how many host bits. And we're going to do this. Two to the second minus two. Okay, why two to the second minus two? Well, what happens is, let's say I give you a subnet mask. Let's start with a class C. 192, 168, 1 1.0, slash 24, excuse me. So 192, 168, 1 1.0, slash 0, slash 24. Where does that subnet begin? The network address that the routers will use will be 192, 168, 1 1.0, slash 24. If I wanted to send a subnet directed broadcast, which hits every host, I would send it to 192.168.1.255. That's called the broadcast. It's called the subnet directed broadcast when you send it there. So I can't use the 192.168.1.0 because that's the address that the router is going to put in its routing table. And I can't use the 192.168.1.255. So how many IP addresses do I get out of a class out of a traditional class C? Two to the eighth. Somebody want to tell me what that number is? Two. 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. So, ding, 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 2 to the 8th, 256. Now, remember, I can't use this, the network address, and I can't use the broadcast. So, 256 minus 2 equals 254. So, 2 to the 8th minus 2 is my number of addresses. Now, that's pretty much all you need to do. Now, there's another way you could actually calculate the number of addresses per subnet. And this is what I call the Mike's I'm bad at math and I hate math method. So if you want to use the Mike's I'm bad at math and I hate math method, all you could do is this. You could uh, look at the subnet mask. For example, let's say your subnet mask is 255. Then you can look at your, uh, what do you call it? At your actual new subnet mask and you can do simple simple subtraction you'll figure it out so 255 minus 252 um, gives you zero one two and three so you can figure it out that way but i'd rather see you do two to the x minus two and you'll be absolutely there as opposed to doing 256 minus your subnet mask and you'll get there yeah that's the bad way at math 256 minus whatever your subnet mask and you'll know so two to the x minus two or two to this so look at it this way one bit gives you two addresses. Two bits gives you four addresses. Three bits gives you eight. Four gives you 16, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you're on AWS, this changes because AWS designed to make up their own rules. And AWS decided they were going to reserve the four uh, first four IP addresses as well as the broadcast. So with AWS, you got a problem. You lose the first for addresses. So if you were to use a slash 28, which again, I would never do, the smallest subnet that AWS would suggest is a slash 28, which again, I would never do. Because all network architects in the entire world use slash 30s um, for WAN links. And for the most part, network architects use slash 24s for WAN links throughout the world. But with AWS, you know, you have the opportunity to put your subnets in there. And, you're, and what happens is they do two to the X minus five. So if you want to know on AWS, two to the, if you have a slash 28, which is four bits of host bits, right? What's two to the fourth, everybody? What's two to the fourth, everybody?
Ryan White, why does AWS take four instead of one? AWS likes to make up all kinds of things and do it that way. Exactly. Two to the fourth is 16. So in a traditional environment, it would be two to the fourth minus two, which would give us 14 usable addresses, but not on AWS. AWS just reserved a bunch of addresses, and now we've got two to the fourth, which is 16, minus five, minus five. I'm going to say it again, minus five. So because AWS decided to do it their own way and they subtract five. Now think about this. If you use the slash 28, because AWS said you could, and you back out five of these things, and you have auto scaling occur, and you run and you run out of IP addresses, what happens to your auto scaling? It doesn't, it stops, it doesn't go away. So Never, ever, ever, ever use a slash 28 just because you could. Because what's going to happen is your systems are going to grow. And if you don't have enough IP addresses in the subnet, auto scaling will stop. Your cloud will stop. Why am I saying you need to have the most sophisticated networking people doing your addresses? Because you will break things and destroy things on the subnet side. Which is why when DevOps engineers, and I love DevOps engineers, say it's just okay to use a subnet calculator, I say, not really. Your replacement will thank you for the new job to replace all of the subnet calculator things that you thought you can do in math. The key is you must know these things. You must see these things in your mind. You must see it in your eye to do design. When you're doing an architecture, you got to see the big picture. The big picture includes the roads, the addresses, where your servers are, where your storage is. That's why we're not touching the text. That's why we're taking back up because we've got to see it. You've got to see these addresses and see the roads. So if you're going to build a map of the country, you need that big picture. Your addressing plan is your big picture. Hey, with AWS, we're going to use the 172.16.0.0 slash 16. My subnets in Azure are 172.17.0.0 slash 16. My subnets and my thing are 172.18.0.0 slash 16. Why? Then I can only send one route to each of my organizations. I can have awesome security. Awesome routing, extreme efficiency, and it all comes down to, guess what? Your addressing scheme. So, slash 30 for when, slash 24 for LAN. But remember, you lose four addresses because AWS just thought it would be a fun idea to do so because they reserved the fourth address. The fifth one is the broadcast address that's a standard address that all ones broadcast. Remember, normal networking is, uh, what do you call it? You lose the network address and the broadcast address. With Amazon, you lose the network address, the broadcast address, and the other three that they felt like making you lose. So there's kind of that. Let's kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So let's visually show you this one more time because we're going to get into some subnetting math really soon. Soon. 16 bits of subnet math. All ones. 16, eight bits of, of subnetting, eight bits of host. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So let's draw it out. Let's go from CIDR notation to decimal notation to binary notation. And guess what? They're all the same. So let's count it out. Actually, before we do do this, I want to I want to count it out with you. So let me show you. Uh, let's let me let me make sure we do this before you do this first. Hold on, let's create a new slide in here. And once we start getting the problems, I want you to think of this. I like to build this table, and this is how I always taught new, new network engineers. 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Seven, eight. Okay, so let's see. Uh, oh, I see my good friend Praveen. Praveen is a fantastic working cloud architect, one of the best big data architects I've ever met in my life. And I see he's here and so happy to see you here. Cloud hired or Praveen. So, oops, I mean, I didn't want to do this. Hold on, it didn't work. So, where's that? Where's the, where's the undo? Here we go. So, now this is what we're dealing with. So, let's say you've got a slash 25. So a slash 25 
is going to look like this. Ugh. Bear with me, guys. Here's what a slash 25 is going to look like. The slash 25 is going to have one bit over here, and these are all going to be the rest of these zeros. Tell me in decimal terms what the slash 25 is. Oh, wow. Samoa Shang, I'm so happy you're here. And please let all your people in Cameroon join as well. Um, I got an email from Nitro Pan Samoa last night um, that actually made me cry. I was so happy about it. So I hope, Samoa, you saw that email as well last night. I was so proud of what my team was doing, especially Nitro Pan. So somebody tell me, Tom Ortheus, you did it. Exactly. You got it as 128. Okay, so next. Uh, co Costa team got it. Good. Keep going. Keep going, guys. I want to know what that one bit of subnet mask is going to look like. Say it's a slash 25. Okay, so let's... Okay, so um, Chi, Chi got it. Excellent. Okay, I just want to make sure you guys are getting it. One bit of mask equals 128. Now, let's say we've got two bits of subnet mask. So bit one equals 128 bits. Bit two equals 64. So let's say we've got a one for the first two places. What do we think this is going to be? What's this subnet mask going to look like? It's going to be... Um, This is going to be uh, 96. Okay, so let's do this. All right, so let's do some basic math together. Tom Ortheus got it. Excellent. Mario, not so much. So let's do this one more time. When we're counting subnet bits, we've got a 128 bit, a 64 bit, a 32 bit, a 16 bit, an 8 bit, a 4 bit, a 2 bit, and a 1 bit. So if we've got one bit of subnet mask, we've got a 128. If we've got two bits, we're going to take 128 plus 64, which is going to give us 196. Yeah, no, 192, sorry. Uh, um, if we've got three bits, it's going to be 128 plus 64 plus 32. If we've got four bits, it's going to be 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16. If we've got five bits, it's going to be 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus, eight plus, plus 16 plus 8. If we've got five bits, it's going to be a 128 plus a 64, a 32, a 16, an 8, a 4, a 2. And anyway, we're getting way out of my math over here. So I'm not Mr. Math. There's people that love, you know, verbal things, people that love math things. I love verbal things. My wife is a math person. She can do calculus in her head. It's pretty impressive, not me. So now let's do this. Let's have three bits of subnet mask, everybody. Let's add the 128. Let's add the 64. Let's add the 32 and tell me what I've got. Tell me what the mask is going to look like. So if we've got three bits of subnet mask it, it, uh, and we're dealing with a, if, and this was the last octet, it might look like, okay, 224, Koslov, exactly. Um, 224, JM, 224, Lion, 224, Margin, um, 224, woohoo, you guys are getting it. I'm excited. How much fun is this? Okay, great. So now guess what? We now have four bits of subnet mask. Everybody tell me the math. Tell me the math. Four bits of subnet mask. What's that mask going to look like? Four. So we'll take the 128 plus the 64, the 32, and then the 16. We add it together. Woohoo! 240. You guys got it. 240. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So now we're going to use five bits of subnet mask. So we're going to add a 128, a 64, a 32, a 16, and an 8. Tell me the math. Yes. Yes. Now we're getting there. Now we're getting there. We're going to go to CIDR to decimal in a minute, but you guys got it. Woohoo. I'm excited. Okay, good stuff, good stuff, everybody. This makes my day. This is critical cloud architect and solution architect skills. You guys are getting it, so woohoo! By the way, I've been text messaged from my team. If you're having a good time, please like, subscribe, hit the bell. 
um, do those kind of things, please and thank you. It'll help me with the algorithm. Um, but, you know, kind of keep that. So let's keep having fun with it. So now let's do six bits of submat mask. So let's add our 128, our 64, our 32, our 16, our 8, and our 4. Tell me what it equates to. Two five two. This is the slash thirty for the WAN links we use all the time. Exactly. So, after we see this, next you'll see why we never use slash thirty two, thirty ones, and why we still use slash thirty twos. Carlito Way. Wow, I love that movie. Ryan White over there. Everything's iry with that answer. Ryan White. God bless you. You're doing great. Ryan, at your age, all those impressive things I see you do every single day, you are doing amazing there. Okay, now, heck, for the fun of it, let's use seven bits of mask, and we'll see why we don't do slash 31s. So let's add our 128 plus our 64 plus our 32, our 16, our 8, our 4, and our 2. What are we getting here? What are we getting here? 254 exactly. So 256 minus 254 gives us two, right? And we lose the subnet address and we lose the broadcast address. So that's why we can't use a slash 31 for anything. Now for the finale, to make sure you get it, let's add all eight bits of subnet mass together. Add the 128, the 64, the 32, the 16, the 8, the 4, the 2, and the 1, and tell me what we get. And that's why we can't use a slash 31 for a point-to-point, -point, because the router needs the 0, and the other address would be a broadcast. Exactly, we've got 255. So, what kind of a route can we use with this? This is called a host route. I route to Abigail. Cindy makes a cat to Abigail's cat. Cindy makes a route to Sonny the cat at uh, Chris's house. They make a route to each other. It's called a host route. It's the most specific route in the world. When would you ever, ever, ever use a slash 32 in your entire life? Only in one useless location, which is highly useful for we network architects. We put a logical address called a loopback address on the router, and it only needs a single address. But we can't use a slash 32 for anything else. As for a loopback address, it is a management address. And that's why we use it. So the smallest you'll use is this. Now, even though I can mention one last address, you'll notice that I said we couldn't use 127 at all. Because devices have their own internal loopback address. Computers, you can reach them, you can ping on your computer. Go to the if config and type ping 127.0.0.1. Or if you're in Windows, open a terminal prompt or a command prompt and type ping 127.0.0.1. That's the internal address. But on routers, we give them a router identifier, which is the loopback address, which is the BGP identifier. And we give it a name that's a valid address. So it's not going to be a 127.0.0.1 it's going to be a loopback address that we network administrators, network engineers, and network architects select. And usually it's going to be architects that are going to select it. And it's going to be who configures it, the network admin people. 169 is an auto addressing thing. It's different. And yes, we announce our loopbacks into BGP. We announce our loopbacks potentially into OSPF. Especially if we're dealing with an IBGP environment where we're connecting loopback address to loopback address. And by that, we need IGP, we need reachability of our addresses. And for that, that's what our interior gateway protocols are from. Say, so yes, we've got some networking people on here. Networking people make me happy. I'm a networking person too. Always have been, always will be. Love the network. Okay, so let's start having some fun with some of this stuff. So let's before we do this, let's let's explore it a little more. So now. Tell me what this subnet mask is. And uh, let's say our subnet mask is going to look like this. I'm going to give it to you now in binary notation. So here's the IP address. The address is going to be 192.168.1.0. Now here's what the uh, subnet mask is going to look like.
Can anybody tell me what this sudden mask is here? We'll start with decimal notation. What are the all ones? Can anybody tell me what all ones in the first octet mean? It's rendered it, okay. Okay, what do the all ones mean in the second octet? Charles Simpson, good job. What do the all ones mean in the third octet over here? Now, what is my last bit in binary terms, in, bi in regular math? What does my last thing look like? My last octet. Because the people that had us at a slash 25 were right. But what does that last octet look like to me? Ah, right. Raul's got it. Pierre's got it. Oh, wow, this is really great. Uh, wow, Theo's getting it. Abigail's got it. Jim Weaver, Marla. Wow, woohoo. You guys are getting it. It's a dot 128, or it's going to look like this. You guys got it in CIDR notation. You guys got it in decimal notation. You guys got it in binary notation. You guys are doing good. You had your Wheaties, your Cheerios, your Fish oil, and your blueberries today because you guys are really doing great. Fantastic. I'm so excited. You know what? You guys are all doing so good. Everybody type hashtag cloud hire because all you guys with this kind of knowledge, as good as you're doing, it's just a matter of time until you're all cloud hired. So type hashtag cloud hired. And then after that, I know we're happy. We're having fun. And then we'll get back to the content. Marla's caught get there. Margin, Betty, fantastic. Charles, Will, Abigail, thank you for the blue wrench. Tell, thank you, Leo down there in Brazil. Thank you so much. Margin, it was a slash 25. You were 100% correct. It's just that we were going from binary, decimal, and all kinds of notations. Cloud hired, yes. So we love Cindy the cat. Cindy the cat is beautiful. Cindy the cat decides that she either sleeps right here at night on my chest or she sleeps between my knees and she stretches out and she puts me in this yoga pose called Baddha Konasana while I sleep. Or I should say soup the Baddha Konasana for anybody that's familiar with Sanskrit and teaching yoga like me. Okay, so I'm seeing some cloud hires. You guys are paying attention. I occasionally see some numbers that are a little different, but I understand the following. If you guys start two minutes late, um, you might be coming in some different numbers and you're there. So Frank K, hey, excellent. Mr. Gee, excellent. Loving that. Mr. Gee, I don't know if you cook a lot with clarified butter or you're you're a jujitsu person and you wear a gi and you do gi jujitsu, whereas I did no gi jujitsu, but whatever the case is, I think it's a cool name. And Mike, I've got a question up here on the screen. That's yeah, let's up. do that. Let's ask a couple of, answer a couple of questions. Okay, so now Abigail, um, I mean this with the biggest respect. I am not Mr. Math. So when you say variables, I don't completely understand what you're actually referring to. But what I will say is when we're dealing with this binary math, what we're dealing with is the exponents. So if t to the eighth the, is, is 256, the way the math is actually structured is we have one bit which equals 128, one bit which equals 64, one which equals 32, one which equals 16, one which equals 8, another which equals 4, another which equals 2 and 1. And when you add them together, it eats that. So I don't exactly know what you mean by the vera. Oh, oh, you mean 2 to the x minus 2. Okay, now I completely know what you mean by variables. Thank you uh, um, for the person that translated math to medium. So what I mean by this is two to the number of subnet bits. So if you've got eight subnet bits, it's two to the eighth. If you've got six subnet bits, it's two to the sixth, meaning two times two times two times two times two times two, times two up to six times. And why is it? Because you know you're going up in exponential exponential math. Now, why are we subtracting two addresses 
because we can't put the network address on the router and we can't put the broadcast address on the router. So that's where the two to the X minus two comes from. We're subtracting the two, the network and the broadcast address. So that's where it came from. So we're doing addition. So if we had a slash 25, it's only going to be a dot 128 in decimal notation. Okay, so let's maybe we, we so it was, let, let me just get to that, Chris, for one more minute. Um, I want to go back to this because Abigail's question is, is pretty solid. And I want to make sure that because if she's got it, somebody else is going to have it as well. So here's what goes on. If we go back to this, if we deal with our eight bits of subnet mask, the first bit is going to be a zero or is going to be a one. The second bit's going to be a two. The next bit's going to be a four. The next bit's going to be an eight. The next bit's going to be a 16. The next bit's going to be a 32. The next will be 64 and the next will be 120. Why is that? Because it's two to the exponent and that's just the way the math works. So if we had a 24 bit, it, so realistically speaking, if we had a 24 bit subnet mask before we got to this, or if we had a 24 bit subnet mask, it would look like 255.255.255.0. Now, uh, if we were to further subnet that down, Abigail, by adding one, by taking one additional bit of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, of the host bits and put it to the network, we would start from the left and work our way right. So we'd start with the 128. That would be one bit of uh, subnet mask. Now, if we had two bits, it would be 192 because we would be moving in this direction. Abigail, I hope I answered your question there. And if I did not, um, please come back and ask at a different time because I want to make sure you completely understand it. I think I answered those terms, but I'm not 100% sure. So let's go. To, so she understands the math. It means 1, 20, 800 bits. You get it. Okay. So I think Abigail actually got it. Um, and yes, that's exactly what we were referring to, Abigail. Exactly. Okay, Chris, now you can go to the next one. I just wanted to make sure we got to Abigail's first. Is the wide area network always configured with two addresses with more than two geographic locations connected to each other? Do we always set one up between them? Well, when it comes to connections, you have the option between point to point and multi point. No. Point to point is a connection from point A to point B. Point to point is a connection of point A to point B. When you do point-to-point -point connections, your routing is simple and elegant and beautiful. When you deal with multi-point connections, it can really get into some complexities. If you're dealing with multi-point connections and you were dealing with things like uh, OSPF, you would actually have to take your convince your IGP to act like a broadcast multi-access network um, when we were dealing with these multi-point networks. And it kind of made life complicated when we dealt with multi-point networks and frame relay and ATM and all these things. So we ultimately used to create sub-interfaces and we switched these multi-point networks to point-to-point -point networks because they're much better at routing control, loop avoidance, et cetera, et cetera. So when you've got two locations, typically speaking, I would connect a point-to-point -point to one location and a point-to-point -to, -point to another location as opposed to a point-to-multi-point one and that gets ugly with your routing. So you could do it, but most good network architects do point to point connections instead of multi-point connections. In fact, on the CCIE exam, they used to make you use a point to multi-point connection and then shut off split horizon to create routing loops. So they used to do that intentionally and they made you use goofy protocols for the problem. So whenever you have a choice, point to point connections, and that means two IPs, one on each side. Just for the WAN link. So yes. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? There's not any more right now. Wow. Then we're doing great. That doesn't mean that they won't come in now that you've now that I've said that there's not any. <laughs> okay, well, you know, there's that. There used to be a radio shack question that's a you commercial that's a you have questions, we have answers. But if we do this live, the reason we're doing it live instead of me just making you a video is as follows. I want you to be able to ask questions because I want you to learn. There are people that make training programs in here, just video on demand, and you can't ask a question. I don't understand that. I like classes. I like to ask questions. So make it interactive. 
please explain a slash 25. Okay, totally reasonable. So let's do this because that's a great question. Here's what a slash 24 looks like. 255.255.255.0. That's a slash 24. Slash 25. 255.255.255, but it's got one extra bit. So what is that one bit? The first bit's 20, 120, 28. Let's make it a slash 26. One, it's going to look like this. 255.255.255. Plus what's 168, 128 plus 64? 192. Okay, now let's make it, instead of a slash 20, this is a slash 25. This is a slash 26. Let's make it a slash 27. 255 plus 255 plus 255 plus, okay, somebody who's good at math, 128, 64, 32, is that 224? I think it is. Okay, let's add a couple of more. Let's go another one. Let's go to 255.255.255 plus what's this? 240. And one more. 255.255.255. 240 plus 8, 248. You see where we're getting it from? We'll go one more. 255.255.255. 248 plus 4, 252. And realistically speaking, you know, right now what I'm typing, this is in decimal form. But this is no different than this, which is CIDR notation. And if you want to know how they got to the CIDR notation, 8 bits plus 8 bits plus 8 bits equals 24. 8 bits plus 8 bits plus 8 bits plus 1 bit equals 25. 8 bits plus 8 bits plus 8 bits plus 2 equals 26. So that's really all it's going. We're just counting the number of subnet bits versus host bits. It's the same thing. So, Chris, before we go on, are there any other questions? Yes, I'm about to put them up. You've got a question. The BGP protocol... I don't completely understand the question, Mr. Wacko, but BGP is used everywhere. BGP is used when you want to connect your entity to someone else's entity. So if you connect to two internet service providers, use BGP. If you run your organization, you connect to another organization, you generally run BGP. So if you use a direct connection, you have no choice but to use BGP. If you're using VPNs, you should be using BGP. So you can do dynamic routing. So BGP is used everywhere. For VPC peering, it's used for BGP. For cloud hub and transit gateway kind of things, because again, it's all BGP peering. So, you know, you've got to really know BGP if you want to do anything in the cloud computing world. And BGP is, you know, it's got some time, sophistication to it. So. Can I suggest a practice site for IP addressing? Yes, cisco.com. They have all kinds of incredible training on networking and subnetting. That's what I would suggest. I would say, for the most part, I go to the vendor. When people ask me, Mike, where do you get your documentation from? I get it from the Internet Engineering Task Force documents that either I participated in or my team did. It's the specification. I get it from Cisco. I get it from Juniper. I get it from VMware. I get it from IBM. I get it from Dell EMC. That's what I read. That's where it comes from. So that's where I would suggest you go to. I wouldn't get anything that somebody made on a webcam in their basement because they don't go to the source. I go to the source. When I taught at Cisco, I was teaching Cisco materials to Cisco people. So it's the source. So I like to go to the source, the people that invented the technology. That's where I think the best place is. So the best place for this is Cisco. And Johnny, yes, spanning tree protocol prevents loops. Routing protocols all have their own algorithms to prevent loops. And But it's not automatic. They all have their loop avoiding strategies. But if you redistribute routes or if you've got these multi-plane interfaces, you're very subject to things. So how do we routing people prevent routing loops? Distribute lists, route maps, filter lists, 
knowing our administrative distances, tuning administrative distance, and making more and less specific groups. I, I, Jenny, the engineer, I would tell you that until I was a CCIE, I didn't have any knowledge with regards to preventing routing loops. Then after being a CCIE for two or three years, then I knew it. So, you know, it takes a lot of knowledge to be able to prevent routing loops. Angelo, what's the use of a network mask when using site on rotations? Doesn't the last number define the available addresses? When using site or notation, you don't use a binary mask. It's all done in the um, automatically. So Angela, so why am I using CIDR and binary and decimal all at the same time? Because we're teaching a class and I want people to be able to understand all three. That's the only reason. It's the only reason. But it's an exceptionally good question. For those reasons. Chris, do we have any more or should we get back to the content? Uh, we don't have any more. But before we get back to the content, uh, let's remind everybody about the CCNA boot camp coming up at the end of the month. Okay, yes, everybody, three things. If you do not get your free AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional ebook, please download it. It's completely free. The link is in the description below. Please register for the free CCNA boot camp. I was an instructor at Cisco, I taught engineers at Cisco. I taught engineers at Riverstone Networks, and I've been teaching networking now for 25 years. So I am running a complete boot camp. It will be 100% free. It will go on for one to two weeks because it's a lot deeper than these AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional courses. We can do an AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional course in about eight or nine days, but the CCNA has got about four times the depth of the Certified Solution Architect Professional. We're gonna do it. It's gonna be live. It's gonna be free. If guys got questions, we will stop and answer questions like we're doing now. A completely free boot camp. So please sign up. Build your networking experiences. Tell a friend. But in order to be notified of these things, you've got to be a subscriber on us on LinkedIn, on YouTube. So please subscribe and hit the bell. The bell will buzz you when we start going live. Like tomorrow, we're going to do some free interview training live. Join us. Hit the bell. Oh, yeah. If you haven't registered for the free Cloud Architect interview training, Register tomorrow. It's going to be a big party. We'll do live coaching online to a few lucky winners. Okay, so I'm getting ready to go back to the content. We'll uh, get back to the content. And when we get back to the content, everybody, please type hashtag cloud architect. And Chris, there was a VLAN question that I saw just pop in. So keep track of that question, and then we can address it on the next break. Praveen, when I see that Guru Gibbs, you have no idea what that means to me so much. Um, so thank you so much, Praveen. Especially from such an exceptionally good cloud architect like you, it means a lot when I see these things. Okay, so we're going to play a little bit more, a little bit more. I'm big for repetition. And why am I big for repetition? If I teach this to you right, 25 years from now, you'll still remember. That's the between knowledge versus test taking. So let's be sure, drill it in, laser-like focus, and become network architects. So let's look through it one more time. Binary, binary notation, once, 24. Binary annotation for slash 25. See all ones plus the ones over here. Here's what it looks like in, in uh, decimal notation. Isn't it beautiful in CIDR? You don't have to think about it. It's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So you're not writing all this out. You're not even writing all these numbers out. You just put slash 25 and we all know. Slash 26. It just, when you move over a bit, and it goes up. Remember, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. That's it. That's all you need to remember. Remember that, and you're going to be there. You're going to be great. So let's do some subnetting process. Now, here's where it's going to get a little bit tricky, and it's going to be a little bit tricky, so we're going to have to talk you through this for a little minute, but it'll be fun. 
a little tricky or not. So let's think. Remember I told you previously that the network begins with a zero and the broadcast all ends with one. So let's go back to the slash 30. In fact, let's put it here before we go back here. Let's make a slash 30. So what's the slash 30 going to look like? Let's make one. We're going to have a 192.168.1.0 slash 30. So what are my addresses? The 192.168.1.0. Can I put this to, on an IP address? Can I put this in your computer? No, it's a zero. So what's this used for? This is the subnet. 192.168.1.1. That's my first usable address. 192.168.1.2. That's my last usable address. And guess what? 192.168.1.3. That is broadcast. Broadcast, broadcast. I can't use it. So I've got these two usable addresses here. Now, if I were to ask you right now, what subnet does the 192.168.1.2 address begin? It begins in this subnet. Now, for example, let's say I had another subnet, 192.168.1.4. This is the next subnet and surrender. You're absolutely welcome and thank you. So looking at this, that's my next subnet. Which IP addresses are available on this next subnet? 192.168.1.5. We have 192.168.1.6. And now we've got a broadcast address, 192.168.1.7. Anybody else know where the next subnet's going to begin? Next subnet's going to begin over here. It's going to be 192.168.1.8. This is going to be the address on the router, which means 192.168.1.9 and 192.168.1.10 is the next subnet. Wait, the broadcast. 192.168. Sorry, guys. 168.1.11. So does everybody see that? So before we get to the next part, which is where it gets a little bit tricky, which network are you on? And this gets a little bit tricky, so let's get a little geeky here. So when we get tricky, it's not that big of a deal. So let's go back to this thing that I, my little cheat sheet, the 128, the 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Okay, so let's go back to this. Now, let's say we have a slash 25. So let's say we now we have a slash 25, slash 25. And if I give you the address 192.168.168.1.10, 168, 168, the beta, the, the, I probably didn't, I probably did forget the type of 168.1.124. Can anybody tell me the subnet that this resides in? Can somebody tell me the subnet that this resides in? You guys can't see something? I'm not sure what you guys can't see. All you guys should be seeing is a text box. Okay, yes, it is, Tom. It's a slash 25. But for this particular slash 25, which sub, where does the subnet begin? Does the subnet begin at 192.168.1.1? What? Does it begin at a 0? 1.0? Or does it begin at a 192.168.1.129? These are the two subnets that we have for this for this with this particular subnet mask. Which subnet am I on? This IP address. This is important. 
So, in this particular address, I am on the subnet zero, Tejas Patel exactly. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands that, that we are all on the subnet that begins for this particular address, 192.168.1.24. Okay, that's where we're starting. Now, if I gave you this address, Which subnet am I on? Am I on the 192.168.1.0 subnet, or am I on the, am I on the 192.168.128 subnet? There's only two subnets with the slash 25. They're the two subnets. Which subnet is the 192.168.1.192? Exactly. It's going to be in the dot .128, which I incorrectly typed the dot .129. Exactly. So if you don't know, we're going to get much more complicated. If this number is not divisible by, by the mask with the whole number, so let's say we've got 120. If we take 120 and we divide by 128, is the number greater than 1? So it is less than, we're on the 0 subnet. Now, if the next subnet that we have begins with 128, so if this number is 129, let's make it 130. If we take 130 and we divide it by 128, is the, is the number greater than 1? Which means this next subnet is going to start here at the 128. So let's come up with another couple of addresses because I'm going to give you some real problems and you guys are going to answer them, not me. So let's give you another one. Dot 64, dot 64. Is 64 divisible or greater than 128, everybody? You guys answer it. Type it out in the chat box. Is 64 divisible by 128 with a, great, a number greater than 1? Margin, good math there. Chow Vanderslice with that blue wrench, great math. Pierre, excellent. Mr. Businessman, excellent. Jim Weaver, excellent. Okay, you guys get it. Now, 157. Where does this subnet begin? Tell me. Does it begin at the dot zero or the dot 128? All right, you guys are like networking professionals today. I should be calling my buddies at Cisco and Juniper Networks and saying, hey, wait, I've got some people in my YouTube channel, which are awesome. You should go talk to them. Good job, everybody. Good job. Okay, this is community. You guys are working together. I see it. I'm loving it. Excellent. Excellent. This is what makes me happy. Learning. You're coming back. You're showing me in real time. Jamie, well, it will be the 128 for this one. Of course, you might be a little delayed on time, so we'll keep working. Let's give you one more problem, and then we're going to get to the fun stuff, the more complicated stuff. Let's say we got this, and it's now a 10. Is this on the zero, is this on the zero one, meaning less than 128? And... Or is it in the 128 subnet, meaning greater than 128? Abigail, I love those blue wrenches in your comments and the way you work with so many of my other students and the way Eva Doik and Chow and you all get together and you all help each other at night. Okay, you guys got it. You're on the zero subnet. So beautiful. Beautiful. Cindy and me are going to have some uh, have a glass of wine. I don't really drink a lot, but I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to have a glass of wine. They have a special kind of cat wine that has tuna juice in it. I'm going to get some for Cindy, and we're going to have a cocktail party tonight. Because this just makes me happy. Okay, so now we're going to have some problems. We're going to work them in real time. So these are the things. Now remember, the uh, and yeah, I found about cat wine on Shark Tank one day, which was a very cool show. 
So we're going to go back and we're going to do this. Ryan, we're going to do it about 10 times. So Ryan, if you're still stuck, you tell me at the end of this exercise and we'll go back and do it again and again and again until you get it, Ryan. So we're going to begin with this. Remember this notation, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. Love that, Abigail. That cat there is cute. So we're going to start with the slash 25. Why are we going to start with the slash 25? Because I've been drilling this slash 25 into your head for hours. So Ryan White, the slash 25 looks like 255255255. 255.128. So I want you to tell me where this subnet becomes from. So when you want to figure out where your subnet comes from, you got to look at the subnet mask. So Ryan, our subnet mask is a slash 25, which means dot 128. Because we're going to count from left to right. So now if our subnet mask is 128, what we're going to do here, Ryan, is we're going to look at that 192, 168, 1.132, and then we're going to say to ourselves, is 132 greater than 128? And if the answer is yes, we know the subnet begins at 128. But here's the real way to, to figure it out. If we, sub, if we have a 192.160 to 1.32, if we take 132, and if we divide by 128 and we get a number that is greater than 1, that's we know that's what that it's on that subnet. Now, by comparison, Ryan, if this number over here in the first octet was 62, what I would do be as following: I would say my subnet mask is a slash 28. Is 64 divisible by 128, and would I get a number of greater than one? And the answer is no. 64 divided by 128 is basically 0.5. So that's greater than one. So I would know that subnet begins at the 192.168.1.0, meaning the network or the subnet. By comparison, if it was, and it also if it was 25, so if I had a mask of uh, an address of 25, I would say, so 25, is 25 greater than 128 or divisible by 128 with a number of greater than one? No, I would know that I would be beginning, beginning on this zero because I only know I've got two subnets with that IP address range. Well, if this said 163, I would say, can I divide 163 divided by 128 and get a number greater than one? If the answer is yes, I would know that that subnet is starts at 192.168.1.128 slash 25. So Ryan, did that make sense for you? And if not, we'll do it another way. So let's see if we can get Ryan to come back. There's a bit of a delay between the time I say something and the time he sees something. But I think Ryan's over there in Montego Bay, Jamaica, which makes him one of the luckiest people out here. And I want to make sure while he's there, um, he's having a good time and he's learning. And I know Ryan real well. He's super responsible. So as soon as he hears this message... Can we try it the other way? Sure. Let's do it. Let's get away from this slash 25 because I think the slash 25 is making everybody crazy. So now let's go to a slash. Let's do the next one. 172.16. Dot, uh, hold on, let me see if I can figure out how to do this and still make it look good at the same time. Because I know I want to have my... Ask my good buddy. I, I actually consider him to be like my brother, Alonzo, how to fix my slides for me because he's a graphic artist in addition to being a great cloud architect. So let's say we're doing this. So let's look at this. So now let's say we've got in this particular situation, let's look at this address, 172.16.1.127 slash 28. So Ryan, I want you to look, consider this in decimal notation. What is a slash 27? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Dot. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, dot, one, two, three. And then we've got five more zeros. Now, right now, where we're at, I'm going to do the following. Um, Ryan, remember, slash 27 means this 
plus this plus this, which means 224. So what we're really going to be dealing with in this slash 27 is going to be 255.255.255.224. So now, I want you to think about this. That's what our mask is going to be. Our mask is going to be coming to the 224. Now, what that means, Ryan, is our subnets are going to be 172.16.1.0. And it's going to go from there to, uh, hold on one second. So now what is 2 to the 5th? 2 to the 5th is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. So my, my first subnet is going to begin at 192. I'm sorry. 172.16.1.0. And that's going to progress all the way to the 172.16.1.31. That's going to be the broadcast. Now the next subnet, Brian, is going to be 172.16.1.0. And that's going to go all the way to 172.16.1. I don't know what just happened there. .1.47, right? I'm not, I mean, 63. My next subnet's going to begin at 172.16.1.64. And Ryan, if we add 30, 32 to that, where's it going to take us? 190, I'm sorry. It'll take us to 172.16.1.91, right? The next one will begin at 172.16.1.92. And that'll take us all the way to 192.168.1. Now we're starting to get into some funny math. I'm not going to make any mistakes because I'm pretty tired. It's been a long day. Had a great time. But, you know, so we're just going to take 92 plus 31. That's going to give us to 120. Or give us to 120. So. It's going to get us to 123. And then from here, you, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to find our way. So, Ryan, what we're really trying to do here is figure out where does this 172.16.1.27? Yes, I, I think, Constantine, I think I started to make a mistake in the math in the end. Um, actually, you're, you're uh, completely right. It ends in 95, and the next one's going to be 96, which is exactly what made the math not feel right in my head. So thank you, Constantine. And then... Uh, 96, we can add and we'll go exactly where it needs to be. So thanks so much. So this is going to get us to where we need to go. So we've got 96 plus 32, and that will get us there. But math-wise, I'm getting a little tired right now. So let's just let's just say that one begins there. So now let's look at these, Ryan. Now, Ryan, we want to know where does this fall here? Because does it fall on this subnet? Does it fall on this subnet? Or does it fall on this subnet? So, Ryan, where do you think this address fits in in this scheme of things? Because these are our subnets that are subnetted down so far. I'm going to work our way up. But look at this. Does this belong here? Does this belong here? Or does this belong here? So 172.16.1.27, is it, does that fit into the range of 172.16.1 all the way to 31? Yes, it does. So this is the subnet that belongs to. Exactly, Ryan. Now, Ryan, while we're at it, let's assume this was a 52. Now, which subnet does it belong in, Ryan? Babidi, you were right. You had in the first subnet as well. Babidi, you got it. Now, Ryan, let's look at that dot 52. 
If this is belonging between here and here, uh, belongs in the second sum. That excellent, so Ryan. So Ryan, that's what I was trying to show you. Now, Ryan, without drawing all this stuff out every time, because you know, even me, you know, then again, I work 16 hours a day, and I've been live streaming for about six hours today. Somehow, I don't even know how it happened, but I've been interacting with the community, and I love it. So it just happens. Um, but you know, a little tired. So my math is getting tired. But now, Ryan, if we deal with this. If we say 50, if we say 52, Ryan, how many times is 52 greater or less than 32? Greater, right? Is 52 divisible by 32? Yes. How many times, Ryan? One or more than one? Fifty-two. If we divide it by 32, is it greater than one or less than one? It's about one and a half. Everybody right? So it's greater than one. Now, now let's say this was 72. 72. Is 72 divisible by 32? Yes. More than one or less than one? Oh, wait. More than two. Is it more than two or less than three? More than two. But it's less than, it's two, so it fits in the second subnet. Now, by comparison, let's say we had this. Let's say it was 84. 84. So now it's 84. 84, how many times is 84 divisible by 32? 32, 64, again, it sits on that same subnet. It's not the same subnet because it fits in there. Now, we've got 192, 168. I'm sorry, 172, 16, 1.93. Is it divisible by more than one? Yes. Is it divisible by more than two? Yes. So it's going to be in that third subnet. Now, if it was greater than 96, where would it be? In the fourth subnet. And that's what we're doing. So you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So um, hopefully we got that. So for the next person here, please tell me what subnet um, the 172.16.1.27 turns into or 1.32. So everybody, what's a 32-bit subnet mask? Uh, a 32-bit subnet mask look like? That. How many hosts do we have in a 32-bit? How many, what's a 32-bit mask look like? What, 28 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2.1. Anybody know what that kind of math looks like? But that equals 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, 2, 5, 5. So... 255. So, 2 to the 8th minus 2. It's a host row. We got none. So, each one of these devices, each slash 32, is its own subnet. So, it's kind of a trick question there. So, if the, they're, they're there, exactly each one. So, We've, we could have a subnet 172.16.1 to 27 slash 32. Our next subnet would be 172.16.1 to 28 slash 32. Our next subnet would be 172.16.1 to 29 slash 32 because it's a slash 32 host. See, the mask moves everything. So let's get to this 192.168.1.17 slash 28. What's that mask look like? Well, let's go to that last octet. One, one, two, three, four. That's what it looks like. What does it look like? 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16. Anybody do that math before? 128 and 64 is what? 196. 196 plus 32 is what? 224. 
32 plus 8 is what? Or 240? So now, let's look at the subnet. 128, 64, 32, 16, 17. Is 17 divisible by 1 with a number of greater than 1? You're welcome, Angelo. So we take 192.168.1.17. Now we take 192.168.1.17. 17, in my case, that I mispronounced last time. Is 17 greater than six? Is 17 divisible by one with greater, greater than one? Uh, thank you, Angelo or Angelo. Seventeen divided by sixteen is it greater than one? So, is it greater than two? So, where do we believe this begins? Where does this next subnet begin? Subnets are one seventy two sixteen dot one dot zero all the way to dot sixteen dot fifteen. Next subnet begins one seventy two one sixty eight dot one dot sixteen. The next subnet begins at 172.168.1.48. So where does it fit? Yes, yes, yes. Tell us in. On the second subnet. Pierre, on the second subnet. Exactly. Alex, the name is Seguera. Um, but in Nitropan, that email you sent me last night really brought me to tears with what, what you guys are doing. Nitropan offline, you got to tell me if you're Chris or I think you are or what your real name is not Nitropan because I'm really excited and blessed by that email that I saw. I love what you and, and the rest of the people are doing to help Samoa. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. I'm so grateful. So now we know this begins on the first one. Okay, Chris, you're, you're who I thought you were. So you got it, 240. So this begins on the dot 16 subnet. How about this next one over here? Is the subnet mask the same or different? You have the subnet, the NHG clarifies where the subnet splits exactly. See, what routers do is they have them table. And it says to get to this subnet, go out this interface. To get to this subnet, go out the interface. To go to this subnet, go out the interface. This the subnet, go out here. Go out here. And the map tells you, you know, where your next top is. Tell us in your right it's the same. So where does this subnet begin? On the first subnet or the second subnet? So does this begin at 172.17.1.0? Or does it begin on 172.17.1.16? You guys say same, but can you just please clarify by typing it in the chat box so I know? Second margin, excellent. Okay, so one more time. Let's work through it. Let's make it really, really complicated here, huh? So let's say we go to 49. Ooh, what did I just do here? Let's say we change this to uh, 49. Now everybody tell me where this subnet begins. Is 49... Divisible by 16 with a number of greater than one, yes. A number of greater than two, yes. A number greater than three, yes. So where does this subnet begin? It's the third subnet. So slash 28, our subnets are going to increment by the number what over here? 16. Oh, yeah. Tosin, you got it. Dot 48. Margin, you got it. Dot 48. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, now we're just doing the slash 28. So Mike's going to throw a wrench in there. 
And now we're going to do a slash 29. So, okay, let's look at this. And the slash 29 is over here. What? And it's going to look like this over here. So now what do we think our submets are going to increment by? Eight. So now 172.17.3.19. Which subnet? Okay. Where does the first subnet go? Eight. Increments of eight. 172.17.3.0. Margin, you got it, the third subnet. If you wanted to do it real easy, how could you tell? 19 divisible by 8. How many times? Or by 8. How many times? More than 2. There you go. You got it. As you can see, it's pretty cool stuff. And once you get the hang of it, it's all the same. So remember that slash 30 that we talked about that you use for a WAN link from one router to another router? Okay, slash 30. It's going to look like this over here. The subnet mask is 255.255.255.252. Whoa, now in this particular case, what's that mask look like? Well, we got to go over one, two, three, four, five, six. So now we know what our mask looks like. So our subnets are going to begin here 10.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Go up by 4, 10.0.0.4, go up by 4, 10.0.0.8, go up by 4, 10.0.0.12, go up by 4, 10.0.0.16. How are we doing? How are we doing with that? Looking good, right? So tell me, which subnet does this belong? Anybody? The first one, Cedro. Okay, so excellent, excellent, excellent stuff. So got it. Okay, we are good. So two more. Now we're going to use the slash 24. So with the slash 24, what do we have? 10.0.0.9. What's the slash 24 look like? Over here. Zero. What, hold on. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we've got the two. So are we touching the 128 here? No. Are we touching any of this stuff? No, it's all zero. So the 192, 168, I'm sorry. So this 10.0.0.0 slash 24, where does that subnet begin, everybody? Where does it begin? Chi, you're there, you're there. Everybody tell me. Okay, that's going to tell us how much. You're almost there, Marjan. So margin, 2 to the 8th minus 2. 256 minus 2 is 254, but you're close. Bob, you're right. It starts on the 0. We're in the first subnet. Babita, Frank, yoo you guys got it. Now, where's the subnet end? Where's the subnet end? Here's a hint. It's it's a it's a class C. There's only one subnet. So where does that number end? Add this plus 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 this, and you will know where that subnet ends. 
It ends at dot two five five. It's completely unsubmitted. So ten dot zero dot zero dot zero slash twenty four. The network ten dot zero dot zero dot two five five. The subnet directed broadcast and everything else is usable. So two hundred fifty six title addresses. Alex Policala. Bravo. Okay, I'm super excited by you guys. Now, one more. It's the slash 30, and it is a 10.1.1.1. How many bits is a slash 30? One, two, three, four, five, six. Our subnets will have a maximum of four addresses, but one is used for the network, one is used for the old ones broadcast, and the two are usable. So with this subnet, Somebody tell me where the network begins. Somebody tell me the usable addresses. And somebody tell me the broadcast address. Okay, so where does the subnet begin? It begins at 10.1.1.0. Where does the subnet end? 10.1.1.3. What are the usable addresses? 10.1.1.1 and 10.1.1.2. Those are the usable addresses. The gateway can be a dot one, Pierre. Um, the router will use the dot zero, which was what it sticks in its routing table, but the broadcast address will be three. The gateway, what it uses, Pierre, the router will look at the dot zero, and the dot one and two will be usable addresses. Excellent, excellent, excellent stuff. I'm not used to hiding behind slides. It feels kind of weird, but I feel like this stuff I need the slides for for you guys. So I'm just trying to, sorry for hiding behind slides. It's not the way we architects would carry ourselves. You're not going to see an architect hide in the corner of slides or behind slides, but sometimes I have to. So apologies for that. Um, this is one of those things that we really need to get pretty visual on. So now that we've all done some subnetting, now we're going to do the exact opposite. Now you'd be saying, Mike, you just told me to um, chop up the stuff down to make addresses utilized. Why are you trying to expand them? Now, in practicality, You'll almost never supernet in your life, meaning you, you won't go from a slash 24 to a slash 23 very often, meaning move up. But what you will do is you have to control your routing. And since you have to control your routing, we're going to, for the for, for IP address purposes, we're going to create these little, little mini networks. But when we have to share our routing information, we're going to have to try and not share so many networks. So why would we do this? So if I want to connect to three different internet service providers, I'm going to use BGP, and I'm going to take in about 800,000 routes from service provider A, 800,000 from service provider B, and about 800,000 routes from service provider C. And my router is going to know which is the best one. Now let's say this. Can I send 2.4 million routes to AWS? AWS is good. Azure is good. Google is good. But remember, they might have 800,000 customers. So 800,000 customers can't all send them 10 million routes each. So when you're dealing with the cloud providers, we've got basically this mini, 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 mini subset of the routing we're able to do. We can send them 100 routes and that's it, just it. So that's really kind of the key. We can only send them the routes. Now, here's the more things. We never wanna share access to all these routes anyway. And here's why. We want to leak specific routes to engineer traffic. We want to use summary routes for backup traffic. Our routing and our addressing and our supernetting determines how perform our network performs. So we don't have an impaired network, as AWS likes to call it, when they have a complete and total global outage. So we want to make sure our routing is smooth. We want to know the direction traffic is going. We don't want so many routes from the routing table that the router CPU goes to 100% and they run out of memory. So we're tuning, we're adjusting. So let's think about this. And then I'll show you stupid addressing 
which is the thing that causes me and people like me to go in and replace, to fix things that other people have broken. And then I'll show you how network architects do addressing. And I will tell you, in 25 years of network architectures, 80% of what I did was when the jack of all trades did the IP addressing scheme. And I respect people that can do a lot of things, but the network is so critical, you have to be an expert on this. Otherwise, you break everything. So let's look at this. Instead of going subnetting this way, where we're borrowing host bits to create more networks, in this case, we're actually going to be stealing host bits to cr create bigger networks. So, for example, 192.168.0.0 and 192.168.1.0, are those two right next to each other? If, by comparison, we wanted to take this number, and this number was this, 192.168.0.0 slash 23. Note, we'd be basically pushing over the network that's one. So if we have 192.168.0.0 and 192.168.1.0, both of those two addresses can be summarized into this address. Oops, apologies, guys. So in this particular situation, if we have 192.168.0.0 and we have a 192.168.1.0, these two can be summarized into this single address. Now, Coincidentally, I could also take these two, the 190. Ugh, this, uh, hold on. You know, this is the weirdest thing. I've got this brand new, I bought like this $200 Logitech keyboard. And every time I try to use the numeric keypad to type in a number, it keeps changing my slides. I've got to go back I, to I've my. Been, I've been noticing that also. I don't know if it might be something with Windows 11, but my number lock keeps coming undone. Okay. And that's why. So, I so, so it, then it thinks you're pushing arrows instead of numbers. That's exactly. Okay. Then and then I won't get rid of the keyboard yet. It's a Windows yeah, 11. Yeah. I, I think it's a Windows thing right now. I don't know. <laughs> I think you're right. So thank you, Chris. Then I won't go swapping this back and go back to my 10 year old raggedy thing with coffee spilled all over it on my Mac keyboard. <laughs> So let's going back to this situation. Um, now let's say we've got a 192.168.2.0/23. And if we really wanted to, we could take these two subnets, this, this subnet and this subnet, and then we can still go in the opposite direction. We can summarize those into 192.168.0.0 slash 22. Does everybody see how, is that obvious to everybody or do we have to back into the math? So what we were doing before was going subnetting, which was this way. And now we're supernetting, which is just this way. So it's kind of like, um, getting in the car versus getting out of the car. It's just the exact opposite. <laughs> so can you guys give me some indication if you understood this? If you did, I'm going to have you guys do the next problem. If you didn't, we're going to go back to our 128.64, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I need a little guidance from you, the audience. While I'm waiting for the guidance, I'll be here doing my YouTube spiel. You know, please like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, that kind of thing. Pierre, you think you just got it? Another walkthrough would be great. Okay. Um, let's do another one. So let's think of subnetting. Subnetting is this. Let's go back to our complete and total subnet mask package over here. Go back over, OK. 
Okay, so let's go back to this. So remember, let's go back to the subnetting. When we're dealing with these networks, we can make the subnet mask and the host mask anything we want. So for example, the, we have a 255. So we've got eight bits of host mask, oh God, this Windows 11 thing, and 16 bits of subnet mask. And here we've got a slash 24. So a slash 24 enables us to go to the 250 zero all the way to 255. But because we've got eight host bits, but what if we wanted nine host bits? And uh, 15 subnet bits. Maybe we were a little reckless. Maybe we had an environment where we had 500 servers or we're running a department store. We're going to have lots of people coming in and coming out. And we don't expect them to get good performance. We don't even care if they get good performance, but we got to get a lot of people into a subnet. We might have to do something like this. Now, we wouldn't do it for our critical systems, but we might need to do this. So by doing this, we find ourselves in a different position. By doing this, now we're in this position like as follows. Now we've got nine host bits. So two to the ninth minus two is the number of, sub of hosts that we can use. So now you can see. So realistically speaking, we can take this right now. Here, this is zero. This is a slash 24. Now, we can do this. We can change this to a 15, which brings this to a 9, which means this 15 gives us two slash 24s put together. Now, if we wanted four slash 24s together, what we would be doing is follows. We would, uh, hold on. So we would change this to 14 and then. Uh, We'd have 14 plus 8, which gives us 22, and this would give us 10. So what you can see is as follows. You keep growing and growing and growing the number of hosts per subnet. Again, you might, might, might have a department store and a wireless thing. And you might have to shove so many people into a single wireless VLAN that you've got firewalled off from the rest of your business. Let me count my math here. 14 and 8 is... Uh, Wait, is, is, yeah, 22 plus 10 is 32. Although it doesn't look right. Yeah, but it's, it's right. Okay, so let's look at that. So now let's go back to this where we're at before. Going back to the same place. So if we take this subnet, this subnet, this subnet, and this subnet, note, they're all contiguous. Zero, one, two, three. Let's go back to that math that we had before. The 128, the 64, the 32, the 16, the 8, the 4, the 2, the 1. Does everybody see how this plus this plus this plus this are really no different than this? Oh, this Windows 2011 thing is going to kill me. I mean, at least it feels a little more like my Mac. But, uh, wow. 192.168.0.0 slash 22. Okay, let's look at this. 10. Um, hold on. Bear with me a minute. I have some really great graphic artists that occasionally help me make some napkin sketches, take my napkin sketches and make things to look really nice. And occasionally, just every once in a while, there's a mathematical error there, so let me fix them. Okay, so now, what is what do we p p think we can turn this into? Yes, exactly, Koslov. That's exactly what happens. You typically see stuff like that. But, um, and actually, it was a cloud architect that drew the pictures for me. Um, so definitely someone that had a less networking background, um, but someone that was exceptionally smart and capable. 
um, that was just doing a tremendous number of things for me. So now let's look at this. Let's summarize these together. Babita, exactly. It's a slash 22. So Babita, you can't just say slash 22. I want you to tell me what the subnet is. Babita, type in that subnet, the 10 dot whatever, 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 slash 22. I want to see the full thing in CIDR notation. Can I go back? Sure. Oops. Okay, so slash 24 and slash 24, they're together. Slash 24, slash slash 24, summarize them up, slash 23. Two, take a second slash 23, summarize it up, slash 22. So uh, let's go back to this. 128. 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So, what are we talking about here now? What can this equate to, everybody? Now, let's say for an example, let's before we do this, let's say we've got four, five, six, and seven. And let's just completely remove this from over here. Now let's think about this. This over here. Let's think about it. We could summarize this root like Babita told us is to 10. Oh god, this Windows 20 11 thing. I, at least it what feels like my Mac, but so it's going to be a 10.0.0.0 slash 22. Now over here, it feels like I've got, I knew something felt funny with that. So now we get over here. Now let's look, look at the bottom half. Does this look like a 10.0.4.0 slash 22? We're going to show you how to use this very soon, Marla. Does everybody see how this is the this is the same as this and this is the same as this? Because we'll show you how we use it, because we're never going to do this for the super knitting, but we are going to use this for our routing. Okay, so these two become a slash 21. I could turn this and this into the following. I could convert both of them into this 10 10.0.0.0 slash 21. What's going on is we're just doing the math up and around. So why would we do this? Why, why, why would we do something so stupid? We're subnetting to reduce it down and um and the whole point of doing this. So let me show you what you would normally like to do. Let's say you've got a good network architect and not somebody that just decided to just play games. So let's say you want to create a multi-cloud environment. Let's say this is your data center. Let's say this is AWS. Let's say this is Azure. Now, if you're smart about your IP address, if you use this CIDR range over here, one set, if you're if you're in the data center and you plan it out and you say the data center is 172.16.0.0. And Mike, uh, you're, you're not sharing your screen. Thank you. So let's say now we go to AWS and we make this address 172.17. Dot zero dot zero slash sixteen, and then over here with uh, Azure over here, we're dealing with a nice, super friendly Azure. They're always such a pleasure to talk to and work with. One seventy two dot one eight dot zero dot zero slash sixteen. Now, for routing to occur and communication to occur, the only thing AWS needs to send in this particular situation is one route. 
to the subnet 172.17.0.0.16. And in this particular case, all that Azure needs to send to the data center is 172.18.0.0/16. And all the data center needs to send either one of these is the 172.16. So now we've got one route in between our organizations, and it is beautiful. One route in the routing table. Now, if I don't want, if I want high security, I can firewall AWS off from Azure. I can limit my routes. I can do anything that I need to do. This is simple and elegant, beautiful, simple, so easy. If we use good addressing. Now, let's say we didn't know, and uh, over here we had the one seventy two sixteen dot one subnet, and we had the. Uh, 10, the 10.0.1.0 slash 8 subnet, and we've got the 192.168.1.1.1 subnet, and we've got a 172.17.1.0, and we've got a 172.18.2.0. And let's say we've never used these exact subnets in here. So we're not going to have an overlapping IP address. But now, we have subnets for here. So we need we can't just take in a 172.17 from AWS. We need to know all the specific subnets. And we're going to have to send all of our specific subnets. And we're going to have complicated routing. So what ultimately happens when you do this you got to send subnets to everybody. And I don't want people coming to me for this te- this 172.18 when it's over here. I want to set up my routing where I only need to send one or two routes. That's how we optimize our routing. That's the whole reason we're doing the supernetting is as follows. Because that's the way routers work. So this is what you don't want to do. Now, this will technically work. And trust me, I have fixed thousands of networks that look like this, where someone says, hey, yep, this subnet's available. This subnet's available. And here's what happens. Six months from now, you've got 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 subnets from that range in the data center. The next thing you realize, that data center is now using the 172.16. Then it's using something from the 92.168. And guess what? On your cloud, you're still using available subnets. Now you've got hundreds of routes. Oh, wait, you can only have 100 from AWS. You broke your cloud. You're over 100 routes. It's all done. So your addressing is really, really important. That's why I say you need to understand this. Will this give you a headache? Yes. Have I had a headache for 25 years? Yes. Do I love networking? Yes, more than anything else in the world. So there's that. Now, I'll give you a little insight into routers think, how routers think. And I'll give you a little insight in terms of how to do traffic engineering, the kind of traffic engineering that the AWS Advanced Networking course told you was too complicated to do. And we can do it in about two minutes here. Um, so let's look at things from a practical perspective. Here we've got a data center. Let's say for right now, we're using a single cloud. I would never let anybody do a single cloud because a single cloud is a single point of failure, but let's just use it for our example. Let's just say we've got AWS. Now, when you're dealing with MP- with AWS, let's just assume for a second that you're going to deal with two routers. Now, they tell you only need one router on your side. So if you were crazy, you would only have a single router on your side, just like they told you. And the reason they're saying you only need a single router on their side is the the router on their side is a logical high availability device, meaning it doesn't fail. But let's say you got a router on your side. Your router is this physical device that you plug into the wall. If the power goes out, guess what? Trash. Trash. You got nothing. Uh, So if the router has a routing code problem, trash. You got nothing. If a router has a line card problem, Trash, you've got nothing. So you can't have a single router connecting to AWS because the AWS router is HA, because yours is not. So you will always need two routers connecting to AWS. So let's look at a really well-designed network. Let's say this network includes elements of the one, ugh, the 
16. Now let's say in this particular network, we have these two specific subnets, 172.16.1.0, slash 24, and we also, oh, it would help if I could type a little better. And let's say we also have this 172.16.2.0 slash 24. As you can see, these two perfectly designed subnets are inside of the CIDR range. Now, when you're gonna connect to AWS or any, or any of these providers, you're going to have to exchange routes with them and you're going to run BGP. So if your router runs BGP on this link, here you go. This router over here is running BGP on this link. And let's say your data center, let's just say it's 10.0.0.0/16. Now, I'm going to make this really really simple. I'm only going to show the routing in one direction and with BGP, you've got to configure your routing in two directions, but I'm going to just show you how you can load share without getting out of order packets, which again, in the AWS Advanced Networking, they tell you it's too complicated. But all we routing people have done it for 20 years. So what we'll do is we'll have router one over here, and the, that router will leak. On the top link, that router will send one route. It will send technically two. It'll send the 172.16. And I'm going to show you where it breaks 1.0 slash 24. Now on the bottom link, why am I going to do this? I'm going to send the 172.16.2.0. So how do routers choose a path? They pick the most specific path, the most specific. So right now, if you had the option to choose between 172.16.1.0 slash 24, which is specific to the slash 24, or you had the 172.16.0.0 slash 16, which is specific to the slash 16. Here's the thing, the greater the number and the cider, the more specific it is. So now if the top link, we'd send 172.16.1.0 on the bottom, we have 172.16. Now we're load sharing across both links and we're not getting out of order packets because we're only using one link for one set of packets and the other link for the other subnet. We're smoothing along, we're cruising along, we got the best, highest performance direct connections. And all of a sudden, this cable breaks. Uh, now, here's what happens. We can still access this subnet, but we can't access this one. Why can't we route access it? We don't have a route to it. So, you asked me why we're doing this stupid, ridiculous super netting, and here's the reason why. So now I've got these two routes. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to also send the summary route on both links. Now the summary route is going to look like this. It's going to look like 172.16.0.0 slash 16. You know what? I'm going to put that same summary route over here. Now let's think about it. Now you're the router sitting over here. You're a happy router, happy router, happy router. You're having fun. You're listening to some reggae. Had some Damien Marley on this morning. I was enjoying it. I'm listening to Damien Marley. And I've got a packet that I need to send to 172.17.2.0. Where do I send it? This link. I have the most specific route. Why is it the most specific route? It's got 172.16.2.0 slash 24. Is that more specific than the 16? Yes, ding, 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 we're load sharing, we're sending it on here. Now, you know, instead of listening to Damian Marley on this link, I'm listening to the Kali Buds on this link, and I'm listening to uh, um, Bob Marley and Ziggy Marley uh, singing a beach in Hawaii on the top link, it's coming in. The top link's working, so the top link is, re is reaching, and you know, one of my favorite reggae bands, the bottom link is reaching another. We're load sharing, everything's great. Now we lost this cable cut. We have a cable cut. All these routes go away from the BGP routing table because the cable is gone. Now what do we have? Bottom link. Specific route to 172.16.2.0. Ding, 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 ding. We're getting here. Woohoo! Now guess what? We've got this summary route, which tells us to reach anything 
in the 172 16.0.0 range. Anything go to AWS. So even though I don't have a specific route for this, I still have this supernet route or the aggregate route. So my traffic still gets back to AWS. Verizon or AT&T or NTT or CenturyLink, who's up or down, they fix their network. The link comes back up. Now we're having a ball. We're sending to, the, to, to Ziggy Marley on the top link and Damian Marley stuff is going on the bottom link. Does that make sense? That is why we use BGP. And that's why we use the route in BGP. We take the more specific route. Internet routing has done this way. We've done it for decades. Modding to multiple cloud providers the same way. We use simple eBGP. eBGP does the routing. AWS and Azure, they say connect with eBGP. It's so simple. And by doing it, we have to connect to them with BGP. Why? Because we're interdomain routing. AWS is a different autonomous system number than us. So that's why we're using BGP here. And that's why we're doing the supernetting. And that's why we're doing the subnetting. This is how all internet traffic engineering is working for external entities. Inside of our organizations, we do things like we run an interior gateway protocol like there's OSPF or intermediate systems. Then we turn on some RSVP signaling. Then we make some primary and secondary and explicit paths after we turn on tag switching or label switching. But that's another story. But this is just standard basic routing. And this is how it's all done. So now let's go to this. Let's go back to this. And yeah, but like, yeah I absolutely love reggae. I'm outside practicing yoga to, to reggae music pretty much seven days a week. My neighbors all look at me like I'm, they don't know what to make of me, but I love reggae. So now look at this situation. Let's look back. Does this look like we did our intelligent IP addressing design? Or does this look like we can summarize routes in any way like I just showed you? No, we've got nothing. It's really, really sloppy. Now, look at it this way. I did the IP addressing. Or I found a CCIE or a CCD, and I said, hey, I need you to come up with an elegant addressing scheme. Look at that. One route in each direction. Simple, beautiful, elegant. Now I start adopting 16 clouds, and you will, and I deal with 500 VPCs, and that's nothing to deal with 500 B VPCs with peering and trivert links and transit gateways, it's, it's not even uncommon to have a thousand VPCs in a big cloud architecture. So these addresses, they matter. All of this makes it simple. Okay, so for people that ask questions, please do not use any kind of an acronym. I will never know what you mean. So if there's a word, just spell it out. Um, I don't know what ECMP is, for example, and I've been working with BGP. If you spell it out and you tell me what the word is, I'll probably know, but uh, I don't know acronyms because um, the same acronym could literally be 40 or 50 different meanings that I would know from either medicine or from cloud or from security. So please be more specific. Oh, uh, yeah. Equal cost multipath gets really ugly, and the reason you don't want to do equal cost multipath is as follows. Some of your traffic will go down an AT&T link and it'll come back on a Verizon link. And when you start doing equal cost multipath, that's when you get it out of order packets. So you almost never want to use e equal cost multipath. It's a little different with IBGP, but it gets really ugly. So now we try and tr we actually try and engineer our traffic and try and avoid equal cost multipath. Because what will happen is you'll go out AT&T, you'll come back NTT, your next packet will go out AT&T and it'll come back a Verizon link and then you get very bad out of order packets. So that's why we always will try to send a more specific route or change the weight on egress for certain routes or have somebody prepend the ASs or have somebody send us a BGP community and we can match the community with a route map and prioritize or deprioritize a route. That's why we typically do it because with the equal cost multipath, you get some very nasty out of order packets. And uh, that, 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 so that's why we typically don't do that. So last bit of some summary information, and I'll answer any kind of questions you may have. What do we use for loopbacks slash 32? What do we use for WAN links slash 30? What do you use for LAN links? Generally speaking, a slash 24, you can get as big as a slash 23. Try not to because of the broadcast. So 
Let's come off of these slides for a little bit and answer whatever kind of questions you guys desire. So who has questions? How can we help? What can we do to make sure you have the absolute best uh, uh, time? So let me see on StreamYard. So when the more specific route becomes unavailable, each in the top, we revert to using the summary route on the bottom router. Exactly, Sean. Exactly. Routers prefer the most specific. So let's say I wanted to go to Eva Doike's house because she's, and I wanted to basically cook her a Greek dinner. So if I knew, go straight, make a left at this street, make a right at this street, make a left at this street, make a right at this street, make a left at this street, make a right at this street. That'd be pretty darn specific instructions. And if my GPS had that, it would take me there. Now, I don't know how to get to Eva Doike's house. So all I can think is jump on an airplane. I'm in West Palm Beach. I can fly to New York. From New York, I might be able to get to her city or I can go to, I might be able to get to say London Heathrow and from there go directly to her city. And then when I get there, that's when I'm going to look for the more specific map. So that's exactly, exactly the case. We always use the most specific because it's most accurate. But if we don't have anything more specific, we take the next one along the way. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Pierre, and I'm, I'm going to go in a little deeper here because I know you have CCIE aspirations, and I strongly support that. So... When we load chair, we can basically do it on the specificity of our networks. We can take a subnet, for example, like this subnet, and we can change the local preference because generally speaking, the, the, the path and the decision tree is this. Obviously, if the next top is not available, don't put in the routing table. Prefer the path with the highest weight. Prefer the path with the highest local preference. Prefer the one with the shortest AS path. So what we're typically looking for is we're going to tune one of those attributes. There's other things that we can do, like the MED or the origin code, but those three are pretty easy to manipulate. Or you, we can get a, something called the community, which is basically tag a route with some information, and you can act upon that information. But yeah, generally splitting is based on subnet traffic. It's generally the most efficient way to do it. And great question there, Pierre. Chris, you can bring the next one. Costlin, you got it. You usually do DC interconnects using MPLSTE. Though, even though you work for a carrier, yeah, that's kind of one of these weird things, you know. Um, you know, the carriers are in a bit of a different position because you know they're using a little bit different. They're using these flat intermediate systems to intermediate system single area things with MPLS and RSVP signaling, or you know they're using single area OSPF, and you know there's a little bit different. But when we start doing our our our, our heavy duty disconnects. We got to get really, really careful on how we actually do these things because the out of order packet thing becomes a nightmare, a nightmare, um, especially for video and voice and real time applications. But it can get pretty ugly. And I've spent a lot of time debugging that over the course of the last 25 years. But it's a great question. And Koslava, clearly you've got a pretty, very strong networking background. Don't be shy. If you've got questions, come off mute. We love questions. We're always happy to help you. You don't ever have to be shy. I'm the easiest going, most relaxed person in the world. A recap, please. Sure, a recap of what? And I'm happy to give you a recap. Okay. Um, Chris, are there any others? Because I, I, I will wait and see what if he means by a recap, because I'd like to help. I just, I don't exactly know what he means by that. I think we got to Pierre's question on load sharing, Ryan, but um, uh, Chris is, uh, Chris, you're in charge of check questions. So please check Ryan suggesting we're making sure we got to Pierre's question. Conley, yeah, we got, to, we got to be your question. Okay, good. Conley, you just got here to learn. Conley, this is going to take some time. Conley, you've got plenty of time. We're going to cover this again in real depth when we do the free CCNA training. Why did I do it before the CCNA? Because this stuff is hard. I mean, it really is. The first time somebody taught me subnetting, I was like, meh. 
I ultimately, I hated it so much, Kunli, that in my head, do you know the things that I actually did? I am literally not joking. I built myself my own mic mask. 256 minus the subnet mask. <laughs> I had all kinds of ways to do the math in my head. And ultimately, over the years, I just memorized the subnets in my head. So, kindly, it takes some time to learn this. I can really appreciate where you're coming from. You're doing great, kindly. Keep it up. Pay attention. Come to this class. Come to the next class. Come to as many classes as you can. It takes time to do this. These are big careers. But I really got to tell you, I'm honored you're here. I'm excited for you. Put your heart into it. Put your mind into it. And you will have a career like you can't even imagine. This is the greatest career in the world. I absolutely love it. And I've done other things like practice medicine and been an executive too. And architect is the most fun thing ever. So take your time to learn. And we're thrilled to have you here. Oh, Chow, thank you so much for sharing the correct links to things. Really appreciate you so much. Tobias, thank you so much. It's wonderful to see you. See you in class. I saw some video of yours and I was really excited. It had some good gravitas, some good energy, and some good executive presence. And I saw that and I was really happy. So, Tobias, thank you so much and appreciate you. Sean T, Cloud Hard, yes, I love it. Cloud Hard, that's the whole point. The whole point of our channel, the whole point of our training. Look, we will help you get certified, but certification is no goal. Here, here's a piece of paper. That's no goal. This, the goal is to make sure that you have good lives and good jobs and happy, prosperous lives where you can take care of your family and live a good life. Certification is no goal. Cloud hired is the goal. Cloud promoted is the goal. Cloud career is the goal. Always focus on what matters. Manoj, thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. Tejas, thank you so much. I was thrilled and honored to be here, and I'll try and do as many things as I can for you all. Coast and GoCon Architects, you've inspired me and I'm encouraged me. You decided to become a trainer as well. You only specialize in micro K. Previously, it was Cisco and Juniper. Well, I could tell you knew networking, and I can tell you knew it very well. Coast and team, give me a call. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. We should talk. Tejas Patel, you're welcome. It was so nice to have you in class. There, Lassie, Cloud Heart. I absolutely love that. Eva Dykia, Mike, can I please elaborate on the loopback address? Absolutely, Eva Dykia. What a great question. So, routers are network devices, and they give you the ability to put an identifier on them. And that identifier is called the loopback address. And what it is, is just a logical interface that you create on the system. So on a Cisco router, for the most part, you create this logical address. And that logical address typically becomes the router identifier. So what you might do is inside of your network, come up with some ridiculous thing like 1.1.1.1. And you put that on a router. And the next router is 2.2.2.2. And you put it on a router. And the next router is 3.3.3. .3 .3. So typically you come up with a naming convention of your addresses and you just put this management interface on a router and it is a logical address. And why are we using a logical address, Ibadoikia? Because say the router's got 50 ethernet ports and they're all on different subnets. But if the subnet that we're actually telnetting or SSH to goes down because the cable is unplugged, the router won't be reachable. But if we put a reachable address on the router and advertise it in a routing, then we can use that to telnet or secure shell into. So it's just an address we're creating to identify the routers and reach them, one that will never go down. Kind of like the say I say, never use one cloud because the cloud can go down. Cisco devices wouldn't want you to actually use the management address of a physical address because the physical port would go down. So they want you to do something that can't be down. So it's just a magical, imaginary, um, fake interface that you put an IP address to. And the router sees it in address, and that's all it is. Um, but on the PC, they have a pure subnet of 127.0.0.1, which is identified as a host address. But the loopback is different. It's not on that subnet. It can be on any subnet you desire it to. So it's a management or an identifier for the router. If you'd like, if you'd like more information, I'll happily answer that. I think I answered your question pretty sufficiently, but if not, you let me know, because whatever you want, um, we'll take care of it. But it's an exceptionally good question you have. 
And on the CCN and boot camp, we're going to talk a lot more about them. Ciao. Love to get better every day. Thank you for everyone who put this together. Ciao. That is my motto. When I teach yoga, I say, let's get better every day. When I teach networking, I say, let's better, better every day. When I teach cloud, I say, let's get better every day. Every day, I do one thing to try and get better every day. Ciao. I love that. Let's clap for ciao. Exactly. Love to get better every day. That is music to my ears, ciao. Pierre, you feel really solid about subnetting and supernetting after today? I am so grateful and excited to hear that. Wonderful and congratulations. Bob, uh, thank you so much. I'm super happy. Marjan, thank you so much, Mike and crew. Always a good session. Marjan, I'm always thrilled to have you here. Ryan White, uh, thank you so much. Ryan White, I hope everything is going really great for you. I hope you're enjoying your warm winter over there like I am enjoying my warm winter, and I hope all's good with you. Dan, uh, you're more than welcome. Angelo, how can you troubleshoot subnetting issues? Um, you know, that's going to be a tough one. Typically speaking, Angelo, when you come into an environment and they're having routing problems, meaning, I mean, I don't really know anybody that uses EIGRP in the last 15 years, but when we used to use EIGRP to have routes that would get something called stuck and active and the routers would crash, when you have companies that have networking problems and you do a show IP route and you look in the routing table and they've got thousands of routes, chances are they've got some subnetting issues that they didn't do right. Dead giveaways are when a company has multiple sites and they've got overlapping or discontiguous subnets all over the place, it's a subnetting issue. But all in all, anytime a company has networking problems or routing problems, chances are they didn't design their subnets right. And that's why they've got a routing nightmare. And that's where things come from. I mean, a couple of decades ago, we had this routing protocol that's just going to end. It came up with it called EIGRP. And in its day, it was good, but it got so complicated. It was like a nightmare. And then we all ran away from it. Even those of us that worked at Cisco. Yeah, Constantine, I had some pretty bad memories of that. I remember looking at, uh, when I was at Riverstone Networks, I actually wrote a paper, EIGRP to OSPF migration strategies. And when I was at Cisco, it was like, nope, OSPF, nope, OSPF, nope, OSPF. And please hit the like, comment, and subscribe button. So this week, don't forget, we have a completely free interview seminar. Please register. Um, Chris will have the link. Please join our CCNA boot camp in January. I promise you our CCNA boot camp won't be like anybody else's. We're actually going to teach you networking in addition to just how to configure stuff. Because I want to know that you actually understand the networking. And uh, if you've not gotten our completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect Appropriate Associate and Professional book, it's one book. We call it the Professional Exam Guide. Please get it. The link is in the description below. AK, I don't really understand what question you're asking. If you use a VPN, Obviously, your two public endpoints need public IP addresses, and anything inside them, you can use any kind of IP addresses you desire. Because once you initiate an IPsec tunnel, inside of that tunnel, you can use any kind of private addresses, et cetera, et cetera. So I um, don't really understand your question, but I hope I answered it. Okay, I flew. I always love seeing you around, and I'm so happy to help. Mick, B, uh, you're more than welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. Every time somebody participates and they have a nice interaction and a supportive interaction of each other, they're helping each other and they're growing. And if I can provide this platform and we can all talk and all exchange ideas, I'm so excited to do so. 
So are the end of the questions for me? Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow. Leo Parati's cloud hired. So before we close, everyone, if you can type hashtag cloud architect and hashtag cloud hired, yeah, hopefully we'll see a few hundred of them. Oh, I even like you. I see Rip there. Oh boy, you know that's a routing protocol. I hope I never have to go back and look at it ever again. My CCI exam, I had to use IRGRP, ERGRP, Rip, disable split horizon, and do fifteen. Uh, route things uh, got back when it was a two-day exam, back when it was a really horrible exam. And yes, um, it's been a long day. I have had more fun with all these live stream events, but Cindy and the cat and I are going to chill out a little bit and listen to some reggae music. So thank you, my sweet, wonderful students that are telling me that I should get some rest. So I will. I will hang out with my cat today, and I'm going <laughs> to listen to some more reggae. So excited to see you all. So happy to see you all. So inspired by seeing all these cloud architects and cloud hires. You guys are wonderful. I'm so happy to have you here. So happy to have you all to see somebody. Robert, I will be listening to some Bob Marley. I got to tell you, though, I really love that Ziggy Marley and Damian Marley, too. I, I really like, especially the song Family. I think it was, uh, I forget which Marley it was. I heard one of them sing the song Family Time. And, you know, when I heard the song Family Time from the Marleys, and I really was thinking about it, and I was thinking exactly, you know, our DNA across humans is 99.9% .9 identical. That literally means Ryan White, who's sitting over there in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and me, who's sitting here in Florida, are 99.9% .9 genetically similar. So when I heard that song from, the, I think it was, it was either Damian Marley or Ziggy Marley, I can't remember, Family Time, it dawned on me, we're all the same. We're all family. And that's why it's super exciting to have you all come here and all work together. And if you remember that, we're all family and we support each other like we're all family. Just think how great we can all do. The careers we can all build. We can all carry each other up. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for participating. Thank you for helping this community be better and have a wonderful night. Take care, everyone.